Uh, thanks for staying. I realize that this is the last session, uh, or rather, this is the, the session before the closing session. So my name is Craig Yen. I'm from the Botany Laboratory. Uh, some of, some people might have uh, been at my talk last month, where, where we share more of the technical aspects of measuring the spread of Sokovia. I think today I'm really more focused, because I have less time, I'm really more focused about the aspect where we're trying to communicate uh, these impacts to the uh, stakeholders and uh, what was the response that we got. So we share about, a bit of our, our experience with this. Uh, I work under Prof. Uh, Hugh Tan, and also uh, we had lots of discussion with uh, Dr. Darren Yeo, who uh, his lab is also very involved in uh, the research in the non-native species, except for the fresh of the kind. But there are a lot of concerns, especially when you deal with stakeholders that are actually common, uh, whether it's in the terrestrial or the fresh of the habitats. Uh, we focus, my talk will focus mainly on uh, uh, two species that we've put a lot of effort into uh, studying in these last few years. The Sokopia, which is the alien species, and Macarango, which is the native species that we are uh, using to see whether there's any impacts of Sokopia. A lot of the work is done by two honor students, Mark and Jolie. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so it's actually two honor students who carry out most of work. Jolene is still in our lab, so uh, in her satellite, she still tries to do a bit of follow-up work with this. Uh, there's also lots of people in MPAX and NUS who helped us with uh, brainstorming analysis and just bouncing ideas. Uh, but before we start, we, we need to talk about the terminology. Every time you read a paper about uh, invasive species, if it's a good paper, they will spend a, a few boring paragraphs about telling you what's the definition of non-native species, or sometimes we call it non-indigenous species, alien species, or exotic species. These are all synonymous. What we really mean is that these species were brought in uh, through intentional or unintentional uh, human activities, for example. Uh, intentional, of course, if you bring a plant through horticulture. But unintentional also if, for example, if you were to clear land and then weeds which could not have grown on land get blown in, or your car comes in, or you uh, tourists bring in uh, seeds through their footwear and all this, which is unintentional, and these weeds go. So this is uh, non-native species, alien species, exotic species. I don't think there's much problem with the definition of it. We're quite clear that this is what the definition is. It's more a problem of uh, having enough information to determine that this is not native to the region. For plants, we uh, are quite sure about we have a good checklist of the native species, and uh, so because we have a good uh, uh, baseline, so it's quite easy for us to determine if a species is native or alien. But if we don't know, we just call it cryptogenic. Uh, but not all native species will eventually survive, right? So some of them will die out, but others can disperse into the wild, and they are able to sustain populations in the wild. Uh, so if uh, if uh, the native species is able to establish itself in the wild and is able to replace itself. The population, independent of humans bringing intentionally or unintentionally new properties, then this species is known as established, or for plants we often use the word naturalized. Uh, being established or naturalized is the prerequisite for calling a species invasive. Obviously, it has to maintain its population before, before it is a problem. But what do we mean by invasive? Uh, initially, some people tried to uh, pin it down on a spreading species. Again, it has to be something that spreads very quickly through the landscape before you call it invasive. But I guess uh, sooner or later we realize that uh, we cannot escape from the fact that we, you need to know if the species is con causing some form of harm, ecologically or economically. And that's why nowadays uh, invasive species tend to come with also uh, in a sort of impression of there's some kind of impact. But impact, and which is the topic of what I'm going to talk about, is actually quite difficult to define. Uh, it's very quite, quite difficult to measure. It's quite difficult to prove. Uh, and if, if it's difficult to find, we call it cryptic impacts. Okay. So I'll use the case of Sokopia to actually uh, illustrate this. So uh, Sokopia Pakistaki is actually native to Brazil. Uh, it's actually very similar to the uh, Macaranga species because both have uh, associations with ants. Although Macaranga gigantea, which is the subject of our study, is not really strictly a mammicophyte, but it has loose associations with ants. Both are pioneer trees with large leaves. And what we did is we tried to compare uh, typical competition studies, right? You see whether they are occupy the same kind of niche or whether one is competitively superior than the other. So we compared termination rates, seeding rates, and growth rates. Very quickly, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, just telling you what are the results. At 0% shade, Sokopia Pakistaki has a very much higher rate of germination compared to Macaranga at 0% shade. Also, Macaranga takes about a few days before it germinates, while Sokopia germinates almost immediately after we put it on our uh, experimental uh, setup. Okay, and uh, Sokopia also seems to be able to germinate at half shade, while Macaranga even at 20% shade will not be able to germinate. So this is the competitive difference between the two species. 
even after germination, uh, cecropia seedlings tend to have a high rate of survival compared to macaranga. So it could be because of natural enemies or whatever that affects macaranga more than cecropia. This more work still needs to be done. So not just seedlings, but trees. So trees of one cm deviation above, uh, you find that at all sizes of DVH, all, all size classes of the trees, cecropia grows faster than macaranga. And because it grows faster, it also reaches uh, reproductive majority at a much uh, earlier stage than macaranga. So cecropia reaches reprodu reproductive majority at perhaps three to five years old, while macaranga takes more than five years, right? Uh, but those were all potential impacts, right? Potential impacts. So uh, what we really need, needed to do was to go out and into the field and see whether it really affected species richness, species composition, or the abundance of macaranga, right? If not, it won't be. Uh, you, 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 people will be convinced. So, but what we found was, for the biotic community, there doesn't seem to be any difference in species, plant species richness between heavily infested uh, sites and lightly infested sites. Uh, for community composition, we also found no difference between uh, he sites that were heavily, heavily infested by Socopia and sites that were lightly infested by Socopia. But when we look at the environmental conditions, which in here was referring to the soil, we found that uh, Socopia infested, heavily infested sites actually had higher potassium content and higher pH, all right? But, but, at the same time, you don't know whether, you know, there's this idea of whether invasive species are the drivers of uh, environmental change, are the drivers of, uh, of extinctions, or are they actually the passengers that ride along in the, uh, as human impacts come in across the land. So it could be that uh, Socopia just prefers a certain, uh, it, it prefers high pH and high potassium, or it could really actually cause some kind of ecosystem impacts which have been documented elsewhere for other species. We won't know because this is a correlative study. Another problem with the correlative study, uh, if you look at these two tables, you might see, oh, you know Macaranga, where you find Macaranga, you don't tend to find Socopia, but where you find Socopia, you tend to find almost no Macaranga, right? But again, this is just correlation. You know, it could be that macaranga and cocoa seedlings just prefer different kinds of habitats. So this is the problem we're trying to find ecological impact. Even after investing two honor students, right, in three years effort into this, and you know, when you go to okay, because cocoa is a tree, it disperses and it establishes and grows on all kinds of land, and this land belongs to different kinds of people. So if you were to go to someone and say that you know oh, this is affecting Macaranga, you know this very nice pine tree somewhere in uh, nature reserves, but they, maybe they'll look at you with a very straight face and very polite smile, but uh, they might not actually be concerned about what you're concerned about. In fact, even within uh, the biodiversity community, people might feel, hey, Macaranga is an abundant species, you know, what's the problem? So there's so many different kinds of impacts that you can actually uh, try and prove. And each stakeholder that, that owns the land will have a different impact that is close to their heart. Right? I'm not going to name any agencies here because this is not a big blame game. In fact, you really can't blame the agencies for, for uh, I mean, uh, doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, but what we realize is that we, we have to also talk to them about safety impacts, economic impacts, things that affect people's livelihoods or hazards, right? And what are these kinds? Uh, for example, very common, you tell them, oh, you know, Perhaps you would think maybe you know cecropia leaves actually would collect rainwater and then it would breed mosquitoes. Uh, it establishes and cracks in nooks uh, and crannies and maybe it will cause structural damage. This particular case, this was a high security fence, and we actually uh, see feedback that cecropia that grew just beside the fence actually has fallen on the fence before and caused a breach. All right, and so all these are kinds of things that people will pay attention to. But aside from this, where we have real uh, uh, anecdotes. We actually didn't find any mosquitoes in any of the scorpion leaves. Uh, and, uh, and I mean, we are not engineers, so we don't know if there are structural impacts. I realized that after investing so much time, we are biologists who are interested in ecological impacts. You have to double up as a uh, public health, uh, public health uh, police and engineer and a uh, uh, security guard. Uh, so do we have the time to actually ferret out all these impacts, proof them, you know, and every one of these impacts takes time? Uh, this is uh, some study on uh, the soil seed bank of uh, Socopia Pakistan here. We realized that the high invested sites actually have uh, hundreds of seeds per square meter, up to uh, a few thousand of seeds per square meter. And you can imagine that as uh, time goes by, Socopia spreads, right? It's spreading throughout the island right now, and the infestation gets heavier, the seed bank is building up. So you can imagine that the cost of eradication will be high, okay? And it gets higher and higher as time goes by. All right, so how difficult is it to kill Socopia? Uh, earlier studies 
found that when you cut it, the which is the preferred method, cheapest, just cut the tree. But I realized that they respawn very readily after cutting. So we thought, okay, let's cut it even more, right? And slice it several times, okay? And what we found was uh, actually even by slicing up to four times, okay, the scope still respawns after slicing. Okay. So you can tell that how difficult it actually is to to uh, kill this tree using che the cheaper means, and you you're left with more um, messy options such as chemical treatments, right, which might cause wider environmental harm. Uh, if it's already so difficult to do it in Singapore, small area, right, with uh, uh, institutions that are quite well known to be supposed to be efficient, right? Uh, this is somewhere in uh, the, sorry, this is Gunong Tanti, right, there's a, a resort over here. Uh, recently we went over there to, uh, to sort of uh, check it out, uh, take a look at the forest uh, in Gunong Tanti, which is a popular birding spot, okay? And guess what we found? We found this species, right? And this is what we identified to be Sokoba Pakistakia, which of course the nearest, po nearest population will be Singapore. Right? So uh, you can imagine that it's already spread to Malaysia. And the likely source is Singapore, because again, if you want us to prove it, we have to spend some time and some money to do that. Huh? Uh, so can you imagine what will happen? Right? Uh, oh, we've been talking about Sokoba, actually, this applies to a lot of other cases. Sokoba was just a case study. Uh, ornamental trade has been a source of a lot of uh, non-native species. A lot of them have, had, many of them have escaped. All right, uh, perhaps a small proportion of what's been introduced, but there's still a number of species that have escaped. And we, uh, if you think about all these species, you know how much effort has gone into actually proving their impacts and which impacts are actually relevant to the agencies for them to to push them to take action. Uh, if you think about it uh, from a conservation side point of view, all species are guilty and they prove innocent. But uh, you think about it from an agency point of view, uh, you want them to over-regulate, they are not willing to do that, right? So most, uh, all species are innocent and they proven guilty. So how do we reconcile this? How do we uh, look at the relevant impacts? Okay, so I think that that is something that is uh, a dialogue that's going to continue. So I leave you with a picture of, of a monodominant Socopia canopy, somewhere near SLE, and it actually looks quite pretty, but that seems like it's a bit scary. So, yeah. <laughs>